welcome to my speech about Braille. I'll be talking about neuroscience uh, and the font that I developed for the blind and the sighted people. So this font, um, I, I'll introduce it with uh, quick exercises. And uh, new technologies for the blind. Um, so I would like to begin asking you guys how many senses we have. Like five, six, all right. So um, we do have touch, sense, sight, hearing, smell, taste. Uh, when we happen to lose one of them, our other senses, they happen to work in a more intense, intensified way. So in this case, um, blind people, when they try to, I will show, use their a sight sense, it's not like they lost it. Uh, I'll, I'll be showing blind painters and architects as an example that Harvard researchers conducted that their sight sense in their brain, in neuroscience, works even uh, further than us who have sight because we somehow, um, we're on autopilot. So, um, all right. So what is Braille? Everyone knows what is Braille. I assume somehow you guys know about it. So um, any language can be translated to Braille. So English alphabet has Braille, and then Spanish language has Braille. Any language, you name it. Um, if they have worked, um, we do have institutions in Greece, Turkey, and France where I have worked. Um, I'll be showing those um, as well. So, um, learning Braille for the sighted people. It increases our attention span, um, proven to be a better brain exercise than crossword. Um, develops the brain areas of executive function. And um, it pushes further some diseases such as Alzheimer, dementia as well. So we'll be looking at it by um, brain scans um, later on. Um, some further um, advantages of learning Braille. Um, okay. So this is the blind center that I have volunteered as a worker. It's in Athens. Um, a month ago, um, I was teaching Braille at an art gallery. Um, so the institution's name is Lighthouse for the Blind of Greece. So here we see a Braille typewriter. So you see you have numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. So all the letters have combinations. Um, for example, to write A, you just press one. To write B, you just press um, these two buttons, so you need to memorize the number order in order to write in Braille. And uh, to write my thesis about uh, blind architects, um, I have uh, volunteered to work at Six, Do Six Dots Foundation for the Blind in Istanbul. So uh, I've written, I've wrote my thesis on blind architects and design for the blind. This is the institution's entrance. It's a statue, uh, which is in Latin alphabet of Turkish and uh, Braille itself in Turkish. I have also worked at the Royal National Institute of, the B of Blind um, in UK, where I was studying. Um, at, uh, I have met with uh, quite a few blind people. I have donated my uh, thesis. So you could also find my um, 15,000 word thesis there at their library. Um, so you guys may remember this scene, right? So usually people ask me, how did you start um, getting interested in Braille? Because they, they usually want a story like, my boyfriend went blind or some, some story like that, my relative went blind, it wasn't like that. So. I was uh, watching a film, then I suddenly got in interested in how the script is and 
Um, I just googled it, and learning the alphabet took actually two hours, so it wasn't that hard. But writing it with the typewriter took me like four hours, at the, which where I learned learned it in London. Um, so this guy on the left, Chris Dorney, um, he's an architect. So you guys might imagine that. Um, when you don't have sight, you can actually um, most likely see like the sphere of where you touch. Uh, whereas there are uh, people who can see the future and they can design buildings that are like 30 meters long in height and section uh, kilometers long uh, for the public. Usually blind architects are designing for um, public buildings since the EU legislation in 2010 has passed. All the public buildings should be welcoming um, sighted people, non-sighted people, and people with special needs. So this is how a blind architect works. Um, there are printers that print um, embossed sections and plans. Now we'll be seeing a video. İsmim Eşref Barman. Ressamı görme engelli. Tam program bir kere böyle bir görselliğe dayanan bir sanatı görmez olarak yapmamı, başarımı inanılmaz böyle bir şey imkansız gibidir. Bunca sene emeğimi bir şüpheyle bakılması beni rahatsız ediyor. Öğrenmeye başladığım yaşta işte 6-7 yaşta tahta üzerine çizgi de e, karton üzerine çizerek yapıyorum. Kendi yaptığım şeyleri e, güzelliğini göremiyorum. Karşımdaki gören kişilerin tepkisine göre but where he creates depth and perspective in something like the mountains of the waterfall or this bridge is absolutely extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. Sometimes watching them, I, I, I had tears coming to my eyes. <laughs> So mainly I wanted to show the research on the brain because um, a blind person's um, a sight, which is MFA, um, can work when they try to see things. Um, huh. uh, this is the brain of a language learner, um, successful learners, less successful learners, and non-learners. So you can see that um, connectivity between parts of the brain um, is functioning less. Uh, in this case, um, it can provoke some diseases such as 
um, Alzheimer, dementia. So I eliminated the uh, uh, middle one. So we're going to compare an intense learner, an intense language learner, and a non-learner. So we can see that um, SDG, which is the, as you can see, like the center of the brain in the diagram, um, is very important for language learning, as well as IFG. Um, so here we see, yeah. oh, that's great. Um, so SDG and IFG works mainly together when we are processing um, the person in front of us to understand this person. The cycle starts from the center and then it makes it connects all the all parts of the brain when we are learning, communicating, reading. So when we forget a word and then we suddenly remember in a foreign language, then our SCG part of our brain is working. So how you can recall a memory, how you can recall a um, word, the more you do it, the more the SDG part of the brain will be able to pull it back from the past. So, um, and then it will deliver the information to IFG. It's also extremely important, so it's where all the accumulation is happening. Um, and then here, SM, SMA is like, the control center of uh, what's happening around you. So it's more like the nerves, you know, the blood, the veins. It's, it's controlled by SMA. This is like the train line, I would say, MFG. So it's more like all the connectivity. So these like circular lobes are called MFG. So let's look at some diseases. Um, so the people with Alzheimer, it means that their SDG, which was, you know, remembering words, um, you know, that aha moment um, happens when we use um, spiritemporal gyrus. So when we try to read uh, someone's face, when we impair vocabulary, for example, you, you're a um, native speaker of French, then you're matching this word with another word in German, then this part of your brain is working. And um, by making it work, it uh, pushes Alzheimer and dementia um, five years, um, so on average. Also, uh, schizophrenia. Um, so this has to do with processing the language. So after you understood, after um, SDG part of your brain has worked and it has uh, absorbed it inside the brain, and then amygdala, which is the left lobe of your brain, is working. And in case you have relatives that have schizophrenia, you might uh, suggest them to learn languages because it, it will help. Um, so also, let's say you're, you are a native speaker of um, German, then you're more likely to stay in your comfort zone and learn the languages in this sphere. But in that case, your brain is not working as much as a German person learning Japanese or Indian, Hindu. Um, so researchers have also found that um, when language learners prefer to learn languages outside their language family, it also makes the brain work further. It helps us to remember words as well. So it can help another language as well. You, you speak already French, but you're learning Japanese, and it will also help you to recall a word in French again. So this was the first section, which was the neuroscience. Now I'm going to introduce the font that I have um, developed. So normally if I were to give you just the dots of Braille, you wouldn't be able to um, probably read them. I developed this font um, in order to help uh, my students to learn uh, the letters in a shorter time, so they would with the new system that I have developed, they would learn it in an hour instead of 
to, or depends on the person, of course. It could take also a week. Um, I have seen that people tend to learn um, some of the letters that I had listed on the bottom faster. So I want you guys to guess and look at the alphabet and choose a letter that you would be able to learn like this. So choose your favorite letter. <laughs> look carefully though. So probably no one is going to choose five thoughts. People tend to um, learn the ones that follow the Latin um, order. So like, for example, P. P is following the letter P. So I can remember, oh, I'm going to begin with the one. As I have introduced before, we call this like one. So when we type in a typewriter, this is one. We had six numbers. So the first number, second number, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So when I want to write, for example, A, I was just uh, writing, I was just uh, writing with one, right? So this, then I need to press at the same time one and two at the typewriter. Here, I need to then press one and four at the same time. So people tend to learn these ones faster. But after they pass, um, like more or less learning all these letters, there, there are a few letters from here that people tend to really like. So I'm going to show that next. We have a winner here. And uh, one of these letters, people tend to never ever forget it when we try to read braille books. So we're going to see which one is that. So do you guys recall the dots of this letter? Anyone? So because it follows the uh, hand movement of our hand, people tend to remember this one. Let's see the second winner. Yes. So I assume everyone remembers that one because I introduced it, right? So one. Um, and the favorite, favorite of all the students that I had is X, <laughs> um, which for me also symbolizes X chromosome, which you get from your mother. Um, so our winner is a queen. Um, it has four dots, so it's one, three, four, and six. So when you want to write this letter, you need to use four fingertips, right? You can't write it with your uh, <laughs> elbow or anything. So, Okay. So we go back to the Spanish. So here... I chose the first three words that I have remembered that came to my mind. Um, so I wanted to illustrate it, and I wanted to inspire if anyone of you guys want to write their own name. So uh, usually people start with writing their own name. So think of your name and try to write it. I will go back to the alphabet so you guys can write, but right now I want you to write all the letters of your name. All right, I guess everyone has more or less an idea. So take a look to your name. Is it an easy one? Is it really hard? Um, I also brought with me, not my typewriter, but this is how uh, blind people write. So you put like a paper in it. And after you use this thing, which is the pen of the blind people. So in, if anyone is interested in writing their own name for real, then I can help them. 
So now we're going to see shortly a video about the technologies for the blind. In the visual kingdom. Ah. <laughs> Bit does it green? Yes. But instead has a tactile surface that can be read by. Uh, yep. <laughs> a person who's blind using Braille. So in this project, uh, what we're aiming to do. Uh, that tablet works with ox, so they pump air in it, so it doesn't use any electricity or anything. Is to create a full page braille display that can be refreshed under computer control. <laughs> the refreshable braille displays do exist, but they have a number of problems. The first is that they only display one line of text at a time. So if you can. Um, sorry to go back. So. Uh, let's say you have a Mac or any kind of laptop and your blind friend just came to visit you. Then by connecting there, so this can connect with just a cable to any laptop. I have text at a time. So if you can imagine trying to read a book on a Kindle one line of text at a time. The second is that they're extremely expensive. A single line of braille typically costs between three and five thousand dollars. And a full page braille display would cost somewhere in the region of fifty-five thousand dollars. Blind people currently only have access to a single line of braille for these digital devices. And you can't do much with a single line. It's hard to read for one, so that's a pain point. But also you can't do things like graphs, you can't do spreadsheets, you can't do any kind of spatially distributed information. So what we've done is we've created the same dots that are created with these old displays in a new display format. So one of the advantages with our display is that it's entirely pneumatic, which means that we can either drive it with air or fluid. In practice what that means is we have a series of bubbles which are either inflated or not inflated. And those bubbles in turn push dots up and down. That means that we're able to produce a display that's a lot cheaper than existing displays which rely on electronics. So we never have to worry about wiring. We never have to worry about assembling individual mechanical objects. We just build up layers of bubbles effectively. Let's say you want to create a full page of Braille, which is what we're intending to do. The thing that's been the difficulty is how do you control all the features that you're creating? That could be anywhere from five to 10,000 dots. So now you have five to 10,000 ballots that you need to control on and off. How do you create such a device that, that has that many physical control features without it being so large that you can't carry it around? Uh, so we have a potential solution for that problem. And what that would enable us to do, in a nutshell, is to control all these five to 10,000 features in a very small space so it could be packed in and portable and could be feasibly built. We really feel that one of the consequences for blind people of not being able to access Braille is that they're limited in terms of the kind of scientific and mathematical things they can do in their access to spatially displayed information. And even being able to do something fun, like see a graphic that represents the performance statistics for the football team over the last year. That's something that people with vision do all the time. And it would be really nice to think that we could actually bring that back. While writing my thesis, um, I read um, Chris Downey's life and Carlos uh, Murao Pereira's life as well. And there was another Philippines architect, but there was not much information on it. And uh, I was very surprised. And when I read that, I learned um, Blind people tend to like voice notes, so when you send them an email, um, they would really appreciate if you send your voice. So I had the chance to talk with um, Carlos Murao, and he has explained how um, he has done workshops with blind people. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't meet with Eshref. Um, however, he has uh, been on a Discovery Channel and he has a documentary on him, how his uh, brain works and um, he has drawn 
a building that's sighted that people cannot draw. So this building has like three points perspective. I don't know if you guys understand this term. And Christoni. So if we were to compare these people, Christoni uh, has uh, became blind after a surgery. So the way his brain works isn't uh, the same with Carlos and Eshref because they are born blind. So uh, they tend to understand the world faster than Downey, uh, but in their own way. So they, t in order to understand what is um, shadow um, and the shapes or the perspective, imagine you have never seen perspective in your life, nor shadow. So uh, people need to describe what is a shadow and what is uh, a perspective. You know, you, you have never seen it. Uh, but surprisingly, their visual um, part of their brain works um, faster than us because they have pushed their limits. So they, they, they didn't stay in their comfort zone. I'm not uh, saying this is true for every blind people. So this is the case for them. If uh, you push what's your weakness, your brain can do wonders. So, you guys uh, may know that Braille uh, was invented in France um, during the World War time. It was invented to, um, to hide information from other countries. So, uh, they were sending uh, soldiers letters in Braille and it actually didn't have the purpose uh, to be invented for the blind. However, uh, the name Braille comes later. Um, Louis Braille, uh, he, he comes from a small village of France. He, he has traveled to Paris and um, he decided to study all the scripts that has been developed for the blind people. So that there isn't only the Braille script, there is Moon, there are other scripts. So he has come up with a script that would be easier for the blind. However, the script is from France. But Slovenia is also leading the way uh, because they have converted a museum for the children to uh, a museum for the blind. So, um, in this museum, we have uh, 170 different tactile contents, which makes uh, Slovenia, again, an exemplar country in Europe. Um, and two different universities has uh, equipped to uh, design toys, so design toys and um, paintings that has Braille, so they have worked. Uh, University of Maribor and another university that I don't remember at the moment. Uh, it should be like Perizav, something like this, from uh, this city. So this is how it looks like. When you enter the museum, of course, the first thing you want to see, the plan. You don't want to lose time touching the walls or bumping into something on the way. So first you want to understand um, the structure of the building. Um, this is, again, um, another type of um, iPad for the blind, I would say. Blytap. Um, this is a work of mine that I have done for the Six Dots Blind Foundation. So it symbolizes the cities that I love the most. Uh, the first one is um, Thessaloniki, the second one is San Sebastian, and the other one is Kilios, which is uh, the Black Sea, a village in Istanbul that faces the Black Sea. Um, these are my references, and uh, if you want to follow uh, my work about blind people, I have a few different work in my portfolio, so designers tend to be on Behance, maybe you guys haven't heard of it, and this is uh, another account of mine where I teach Greek and Turkish, and English as well, but I assume you guys don't need to learn English, so thank you for listening to me. I hope it has been useful for you guys. 
Thank you. But, uh, I had a question related to uh, reading. Uh, I was told that uh, reading in Braille is uh, uh, actually faster than uh, reading visually, and I guess I wanted to get your feedback on why you think that is the case or isn't the case, um, and maybe a bit of an explanation behind that. Um, of course, it depends on uh, how long you've been reading, when you learned, if you learned from a young age or not. Uh, but it, for example, Braille takes more space than the characters that Latin alphabet has. So the issue that I have faced when I was designing a font was to tackle the problem of uh, why it's taking so much space. But imagine, as a sighted person, that there is a page that has like six phrases. So you would like love to read it because it's divided into, you know, so many pages. So, for example, um, a Harry Potter book of this thickness for Latin alphabet when it's like this much, then for Braille it would be like this much. In this case, it provides motivation as well. So there's ups and downs of having thick books, but it provides maybe some sort of motivation. Uh, I have a, thank you for the talk, super interesting. I have a very basic question on um, when do blind people know how to expect Braille? I go to museums, buildings, you see Braille at the entrance, or, or you don't see it. How do they know um, when it's coming, and how available is it, really? Um, so, usually blind people, before they enter a building, they want to see ramps, if, I'm, if it makes sense. So, p blind people naturally don't like stairs. And uh, usually the uh, ramps, uh, should have uh, these trays, like um, trails, where you hold. So they should be leading you inside where the information is. Well, <laughs> in Northern Europe, maybe it's possible, but I haven't seen it in Greece, Turkey, etc. Uh, hello, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I, was, I have one question uh, regarding this uh, braille. This uh, braille. Uh, if in all countries, is the same, or if it's different? If if it's different, is it, for example, if you uh, uh, can read uh, Braille in Turkey, it will be uh, easy to learn uh, Braille uh, Braille for uh, in Greece or in France. Mm -hmm. or? Um, so, for example, uh, for Spanish, there is only one extra letter if you compare Spanish alphabet to English alphabet. So. Oh and uh, where you get this accent. So you just need to learn one extra letter if you're learning Spanish alphabet. But Turkish alphabet, for example, it has seven extra letters, like uh, the, they, they, they sounds like sh, t, which European languages don't have, so they have extra letters. And Greek as well has uh, many accents. So you do need to learn extra uh, uh, letters, letters, but the letters are usually the they have been translated from English. So 80% it will be the same. Yeah, if somebody has a um, mother tongue, has, uh, I don't know, Chinese, they have more ideograms, uh, how they can uh, re uh, write uh, this. There are many studies for Japanese um, Braille alphabet. And um, actually, you can look into that. So. Uh, I assume Chinese people are using the technology that Japanese people have developed because there's so much information for the Japanese speakers on Braille, but whereas I haven't seen much on Chinese yet. Um, I think Chinese Braille is based on the pinyin, the romanization of Chinese. It's not based on the characters. Mm -hmm. So that's a, um, the Latin alphabet, basically. So it's, it's not that different to European languages when it's written down. Yeah. But there must be some kind of tone in indication, so that, that adds an extra element to it. I have a possible accessibility problem, but I don't know if it's a screen up there. But I'm colorblind, and yes. I can't see the dots on some of the letters. Thank you. So, <laughs> you're welcome. <Back. laughs> I would like to comment on that as well again. Uh, I'm researching. Uh, how to implement LED light into dots. So when we will design a building again, I have worked for a few airports so far in uh, Saudi Arabia and implemented rail design. Um, I'm, the way I 
made the fonts different was for the size of people to learn. Um, so when we go back, um, it was coming from green to red. So red means like it's hard and the green means um, it's easy. Um, so here we go. Um, usually, you know, one dot, two dots, they, people tend to like these ones. They find it easy to learn. Whereas, you know, when they're, there is four dots, people are like, oh, emergency, I don't understand. So that's the reason why the font is in red. But thank you for the feedback. And thank you for the interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. <laughs>